Uh, thank you, Joanna. <coughs> I'm meant to be doing the introduction. I just thought I was going to get away nice and lightly, but at the meal today, mihi nui ki a koe te kato kai tai mai rongo di reo kopa reo kara ngota kopa pui itu mai te nei wā no reira kanuinga mihi ki a koe te no mai aro mai. It is my pleasure today to actually um, welcome Professor Bruce Clarkson. Um, I could spend a long time talking about all his accomplishments and um, all the positions he's had and still has and go on and on and on. That would be the whole hour gone, I would think. But probably what we most need to know about Bruce is that he really is a man that has his feet on the ground. A deputy uh, vice chancellor of research at what University of Waikato, well, that sounds really, really big time. Bye. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> um, he, you know, he really is a man that has his feet on the ground, and that's what we most need. You know, Bruce is from Taranaki. His first big job, he tells me, was writing a uh, study on Mount Taranaki, at the botany of the, of the mountain. He did that not by consulting other people's uh, research. He walked the mountain. He climbed the mountain. And that's the sort of man that he is, a person close to the ground. When I was working for the university in Hamilton, he had a contract with the Hamilton City Council to do a survey of the biodiversity in Hamilton City. And it was a bit of a desert. And one of the big features of Hamilton is that you've got these wonderful galleries going through where all the weeds in the world have their conventions. You know, Hamilton is very much a sort of a conference centre of a town and the weeds have their conferences, or used to, in the gullies. So Bruce po pointed this out to the council, showed them the problem and turned it into a challenge. Those gullies, rather than being a problem, could be the thing that brings people to Hamilton. The solution wasn't with the council or the regional council or the Department of Conservation, the solution was with the community. If a place is going to be well, it's because the community is well informed and really involved with making it happen. And that's the sort of thing that Bruce has been leading all around the country. That's what we've come to hear tonight. And so it's my pleasure to welcome you, Bruce, to, to the stage here, to talk to us here in Tauranga Um This is a beautiful city, our city, our home, so let's make it even more beautiful. So no reira e te rangatira, ka nui ngā mihi ki aakou, ki aakou, no mai ki tēnei rohi, tauranga moana, ngai te rangi, ngā te rangi nui, ngā te puke, ngā me ngā iwe nuhuani wangi a mātou, ka nui ngā mihi ki aakou, no mai ara mai, huri noa ki a tātou to arei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā oki tātou katoa. I'm just doing the check. Yes, I did turn the machine on. Thank you for those kind words, Rob, and it is a privilege to be here tonight. Ko Bruce Clarkson na hau, ko Taranaki te maunga, ko Manganui te awa, ko Nati Pākea te iwi, ke Kiri Kiri Roa i nōhuna ana e naia nei, Kaiti Fore Wananga O Waikato Aho e Mahiana Tenakoto Katoa. As I said, it's a privilege to be here tonight and thank you from that welcome for that welcome, Rob. I wanted to start at the beginning, and when I say the beginning, I'm not talking about pre-European, although I'd love to spend some time talking pre-European, but what I am going to start with is the mention of the first European who really understood what Europeans had done to our flora and fauna and started doing something about it. And that's really going to be my message tonight about what we need to do about it. So Richard Henry in 1894 took the endangered kākāpō and moved it to some offshore islands so it could escape the predation of the stoats, the weasels and the rats. And his remarkable work was followed on by the New Zealand Wildlife Service. Don Merton is the name that comes to mind for most people. 
and in the 1970s they started a conservation program which involved protecting our remarkable birds, our fauna, on offshore islands. It seemed quite logical that that would eventually develop into the DOC Mainland Island program. DOC formed in 1987, of course, and in 1995 they recognised that we needed to move beyond just protecting the more than 220 offshore islands of New Zealand and do something about degradation and decline on mainland New Zealand. Today we have come to a situation in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where there are now 73 sanctuaries on mainland New Zealand where people are doing intensive pest control to protect our flora and fauna. And the most remarkable thing about it is that 42 of them are essentially community-led. Yes, the government agency, the Department of Conservation is sitting in the wings and helping, but most importantly, New Zealanders have taken responsibility for biodiversity in their own local area. I'm going to turn now to the topic of my talk, which is about the urban environment. As I've got older and less active, Rob, you mentioned me climbing mountains. Well, that doesn't happen too often these days. As I've got less active, I guess I've taken a greater interest in what's in my own backyard. And of course, we all know that we are living in an increasingly urban world. 54% of the world's population live in cities, and by 2050, it's predicted that 64% of us will live in towns and cities. And cities do big things to all sorts of things, resource and biodiversity in particular. So London has an ecological footprint 125 times its land area. Tokyo has an ecological footprint three times the area of Japan, and the average world citizen has an eco footprint of 2.7 hectares, while there are only 2.1 hectares of bioproductive land and water per capita on the globe. As I wonder who knows who said this famous statement here. <coughs> no, close, Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> So, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. This is sort of the context for some of my talk tonight. I'm posing the question, really, how about we don't look at cities as the problem, but we look at them as the potential solution for saving our biodiversity. So, my talk will be roaming around the topic of nature, native plants and animals in particular, green space, and what we've come to learn is this new concept, natural capital, a broader concept. But before I do that, I just wanted to introduce you to this topic of urban ecology. Urban ecology is a new discipline. It's been around for approximately 20 years. There are still debates and arguments going on about whether it came out of Germany or the US or the UK. But forget that, put that behind us. The critical thing about urban ecology is it's a new type of ecology, an emerging interdisciplinary field that aims to understand how humans and ecological processes can coexist in human-dominated systems. And of course, the goal of urban ecologists is to help societies with their efforts to become more sustainable. Aotearoa New Zealand, we are no different to most parts of the world except we do have a very high proportion of our population that are urban dwellers. We don't think of us, ourselves that way, do we? We still think that we're all living out on the farm. It's not true. It hasn't been true for quite a long time. Most of our urban centres, of course, are located around our coastline, like particularly, particularly like Tauranga, I can look out the window right now. No, I can't. They've drawn the curtains. And there it is, the ocean's right nearby. I mean, that's where most of our cities are. There's a few that are inland. I come from Kirikiri, Roa, Hamilton. Of course, that's an inland, an inland city. But you know, what we call a city in our country, of course, hardly merits the title internationally. We really have only one city in New Zealand. The rest are towns, let's face it. 87% of urban dwellers have a population of 4.6 million and growing. Our urban areas are rather small and our population densities are low. And this should be 
an opportunity for us. You know, we're in a better condition than most other parts of the world. But you know what? Our record is not great. And that last statistic that I bolded there, native vegetation cover in the built-up areas of New Zealand's 20 largest urban centres ranges between less than 1% and up to 8.9%. The city, no, the town, with the largest proportion of native vegetation remaining in the built-up area is New Plymouth. <laughs> By proportion, this is a proportion. So we've been trying to understand how biodiversity in urban environments is distributed on the landscape. And to do this, we've done some work on using various GIS um, um, models and the, the diagram here is just to show the sort of analysis that we've done where we've used the land cover database and we've looked at the distribution of indigenous vegetation on the landscape to try and to get a handle on using indigenous vegetation as a surrogate for our indigenous biodiversity. Of course that's a big assumption but actually that's really the only database we've got at the moment to do this sort of work. Anyway, the results of some of that work are extremely interesting. These are the curve types for New Zealand's 20 largest urban centres. I come from one in curve A. There are seven cities in New Zealand with the flat line curve. In other words, if you start on the left at the centre of the city and work yourself out into the peri-urban and rural zone, how much indigenous cover remains? Well, the answer in Hamilton, Kirikiriroa, is not much. All the way out to, out to 20 k's out from the urban centre. And then the other cities in New Zealand, depending mainly on their topography, the roughness of their terrain, and their past history at protecting indigenous vegetation, have these different curve shapes. You can see that Wellington is a sea curve. You know, that, all that high ground around the port there, with the town belt that was protected, but once you get beyond the town belt, you start losing the indigenous vegetation. New Plymouth is a strange curve. It's the curve shown there, curve D, a single city in New Zealand. So it's got its record amount in the built up part of the city, but then it takes a plummeting dive as you move out of the city into the intensive dairy country and only starts to increase as you get closer and closer to the National Park. In 1840, the original plan for New Plymouth City had within it a green belt. What happened to the green belt? They gave it away to dairying. Right. I want you to focus on the axis there and look at the figure 10 for 10%, because I'm going to pick up an argument about how much indigenous cover we should actually have in our urban environments if we are serious about indigenous flora and fauna persisting in an urban environment. And I'm just showing you that curve at the moment because I'll pick this up a bit later. Notice the scale has changed slightly here and you see the distance between 5 and 10 and 10 and 20 has been crushed up to fit, fit the curve there but notice in the, from zero through to 10 kilometres, you're still below the 10% 10, 10 threshold. And the data for Tauranga shows that taking the whole area, only 3% of Tauranga has indigenous vegetation cover. So where is this leading me? It's leading me into this argument. So the argument here is I've been living in the red zone for most of my life. I've been living first in Taranaki, which is a star there showing the red zone. These are parts of the country where indigenous cover has been reduced to less than 10% of the area. And of course I moved up to Hamilton and guess what? I continued to work in the red zone. And Tauranga, I don't have a star on it, but you can see where it is and it's got a bit of red around it. And so what this is saying is that these are the places that have been most impacted by human development. Of course, that seems a bit straightforward, except that in the Taranaki case, of course, it's the whole of the volcanic ring plane 
and the whole of the daring, intense daring country that has removed our natural biodiversity. So where am I leading? This is where I'm leading. This is the science behind the loss of species. These are species area decay curves. And what they show, if you look at the figures along the bottom axis at the point zero point one zero, that is the 10% threshold. And what it shows is that once you get below the 10% threshold, we lose species out of all proportion to the total area that they once lived in. So again, I'm coming back to the argument, if you are serious about protecting flora and fauna and you want them to persist on the landscape, no matter what you do, if you're dipping below the 10%, you're up against it, fully up against it. And why 10%? Well, it's, I'm saying it's semi-arbitrary. There's a lot of science sitting behind it. And there was actually a recent paper published in 2017 in the New Zealand Journal of Ecology, which points the finger squarely at the need where cover is near or below 5 to 10%. Further forest clearance in these low cover landscapes is likely to have impacts on native bird communities, while even small increases, note that statement, small increases in forest cover may produce large benefits. So now I'm going to sort of work my case study to show you what is possible in a place that is well below the 10% threshold and what can be done to help fix the problem. So there's good old Kirikiriwa Hamilton sitting in the middle of the indigenous <coughs> biodiversity desert surrounded on all sides by important agricultural primary production, which is, you know, contributing to our living, but has basically removed right down to the last 1.6% of indigenous vegetation remaining in the whole of the Hamilton Basin and within the city itself, less than 2% indigenous vegetation cover. A beautiful city nevertheless, with the mighty Waikato running right through the middle of it and bisecting the city. And yes, quite a lot of green cover. But the question is, what have we done to look after our own indigenous flora and fauna? When subdivisions occur, in, and now and in the past have occurred in Hamilton, they have been devastating for indigenous flora and fauna even though we were already down at that last 2%, development continues to chip away at and remove the last examples, the last potential for how we might protect our indigenous cover. The image on the bottom left, 1967, is the 1967 black and white photograph, it's a bit hard probably to see from the back, which shows the view across the Hamilton Gully where Bev, my wife who's here with me tonight and I live, and what it used to look like in 1967. You can still see in that photograph traces of fences because actually the gully at that stage was grazed by grazing animals. And it was also the location of a tire dump from the local garage. When they'd run, the tires had worn out, they just tossed them in the gully. And the person who built their home there and 10 years or so ago found that out to their cost when they tried to put the poles down for the house and they went into the ground, hit the tires and bounced straight back up. <laughs> so anyway, massive, because the point about subdivisions is subdivisions are the opportunity to build green space and indigenous vegetation into the system. Don't, don't just destroy it all at that point. So Hamilton City has very little to work with. We have 67 key sites in Hamilton City and their mean size is 1.1 hectare. So we have way less existing resource than Tauranga does currently and I'll get onto that a little bit later. But here they are, the gems of Hamilton, Kirikiri Ra, the one at the top left is our last remnant of our Kahikatea semi-swamp forest at Claudelands Bush and the one at the bottom left is Hammond Bush where we still have Tawa, and we still have a Matai, and we have in particular 
Waiwaka, or Swamp Māori, the last remaining stand in the whole city. So the picture on the right shows our, the current condition of Claudelin's bush, and of course it's being looked after to the max. It's only 5.2 hectares in size. It has an understory and a ground cover, now completely removed of Tradescantia. It is pristine, it is as good as you will ever get in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we know lots about how to restore existing patches of native vegetation. It's simply around fencing them, removing weeds and pests, buffering them in various ways. But above all, it's also about when they're particularly small patches, about expanding them and connecting them to adjoining patches. And in cities like the one where I live, Hamilton, Napier and Hastings and Christchurch, reconstruction is of, and retrofitting of indigenous habitat is needed. In other cities, you need both restoration and reconstruction. I'm going to get to explaining the difference between restoration and reconstruction shortly. Here we go, reconstruction. Reconstruction is, ab is about building new habitat from scratch. Because if you have insufficient habitat and you can't make the 10% threshold because you have insufficient habitat remaining, you need to do actively do something about it. You need to build new habitat. So it's about moving beyond <coughs> revegetation. It's about having a knowledge of target ecosystems and habitats, about full assemblages and species occupancy, and about building habitat for all components of the ecosystem, not just birds. Habitat reconstruction is best done using a natural succession framework. Learning from nature and mimicking nature to rebuild habitat. This idea is reasonably old. A.D. Bradshaw in 1983 threw the challenge out to ecologists saying, well, actually the ultimate challenge for you ecologists is to reconstruct ecosystems. Because if you can't reconstruct them, you don't even know how they work, do you? This is the ultimate challenge. And some of us have tried to take up this challenge. So we've been looking to link natural succession frameworks and recovery to restoration and reconstruction. And to do this, we apply the successional framework, pioneer trees first, midterm, uh, intermediate succession species second, late, succession, uh, late successional species later in the planting process. Understanding the different constraints and opportunities presented by the environment and understanding the environmental drivers that make the system work. And that's what I'm going to continue to amplify, I hope, as we go. Now Ro Rob very kindly introduced you to the notion of a Hamilton Gully. This is the archetypal Hamilton Gully. There's all the houses, the subdivision, the suburban area, and there's our gullies. 5,000 years ago, because of the deep downcutting of the Waikato River and a process known as spring sapping, these gullies were formed. Of course, uh, there are very few clues today about what used to be in the gully, and I've the name, of course, is the giveaway here. This is one of the main reasons we need to take much more, pay much more attention to Matauranga, because we can learn so much about the previous landscape and use that information to um, inform our restoration processes. So the Manga Ko Tukutuku Gully, named after our native tree fuchsia, Ko Tukutuku, the fuchsia, uh, the tree fuchsia. Hamilton gullies are largely filled, however, with all of the rubbish and all of the weeds known to humankind. But the point is they provide a place where we can do something about bringing back our indigenous flora and fauna. Now there is some indigenous flora and fauna even within these exotic dominated, what some people call novel gully vegetation. I prefer not to use the word novel. I don't see anything exciting about them at all, actually. They do not provide the ecosystem services needed to maintain our indigenous flora and fauna. Occasionally, there'll be the ruru still lurking in there, but the willow itself is no good 
for our nectar feeding birds. And so we have adopted target ecosystems for the Hamilton Gully rather like this. And we have been working towards trying to reinstate these ecosystems in Hamilton Gullies. So our major target ecosystem is the Kahikatea Pukatea Swamp Mairi Forest. And then, of course, what are all the things that should be there with it? Where are all the birds and where are all the insects? In Hamilton, Waiwaka or Swamp Mairi is a very important component of it and we are really worried at the moment about what might the likely impact be of myrtle rust because Waiwaka or Swamp Mairi will be susceptible to myrtle rust and it's one of our key ingredients for restoration. It's one of our few native trees that can give green goddess an arum lily and all of those other weeds a run for its money. So the question then is, well, okay, what have you been doing and has it worked? Well, we've been doing restoration in Hamilton gullies for quite a long time now. And the two photographs are just some examples of the sort of restoration that's been done. On the left, the Munga Iti Gully, where we have an early successional uh, uh, wetland community dominated by the Caraxes after seven years of work. And the one on the right is a 20-year-old um, restoration. It's actually now been going for 25 years or more. This is our backyard, Bev's backyard and my backyard, where we've been doing this work in our own backyard. And we have the beginnings of a Kahikatea um, Harakiki semi-swamp forest, well established by now. But of course we weren't the first people to do this. There have been many other people who've been doing this longer in Hamilton City. And this is probably the record site, if you like, because the oldest plantings in a small gully called Seely's Gully are now up to 55 years old in some places and at the minimum throughout the gully, 40 plus years of work. So this was the site uh, in November of two years ago, I think it was now, of an ecological society field trip that was run to the gully to show our international visitors and our visitors from other parts of New Zealand how far have we come. Now we didn't tell them that this was a recreated gully. We didn't tell them that it was artificial in a sense that it had been planted by human beings and was not a natural existing forest patch. And we took them to the site and asked them to assess this in terms of Kakatiya forests they were familiar with. Uh, I can't um, read you, and I won't try to read you, all of the commentary there on Instagram. See how socially media up-to-date I am. <laughs> that was flying around at the time, but in short, what these people said was, this is a fantastic Kahikatea forest, it must be natural. Well, actually, it wasn't. It was created. And, um, and I think the message there is that, yes, even in the face of all of those weeds, we can do it. So in Hamilton, once we've sort of got the gully stuff off the ground, we started thinking more broadly because just doing restoration or reconstruction in a gully is not going to be enough for Hamilton City, mainly because the gully is a particular type of habitat. You know, the gully bottom and the swampy bottom is not the same as having good examples at the more widely across the city landscape. And so in the early 2000s, a Millennium Project was proposed to create a new park just to the northwest and right next to the Hamilton Zoo on the edge of Hamilton City. Uh, it took a lot of work to convince all of the councillors on the council that actually you could hand this public land over to the community and they would really look after it and do something worthwhile. So after a long period of debate, by 2004, the first tree was planted. Over, and this is an area of 60 hectares. Uh, the target symbol on the right is some land, 5.1 hectares, that has been added recently after a bit of a tussle with the councillors who wanted to sell the public land to the private developer, a tussle that we won. 
Uh, and the map shows the variety of different ecosystems or target ecosystems that are being developed at this site, all the way from Kauri, Kanuka Forest on the ridges, right the way down to the Kahikatea semi-swamp forest on the lower slopes, and of course the aquatic environment of the peat lake also being restored. 